Thank you very much, uh, Professor Margeletti. First of all, uh, let me thank uh, the organizer for uh, this invitation. Thank you to General Miglietta and to General Farina and to all the staff. So I would like to focus uh, on the main uh, geopolitical trends uh, unfolding the broader Mediterranean region or the Middle East and North Africa region, the MENA region. In doing this, uh, I'd like to start uh, remembering that 2020 marks uh, the 25th anniversary of the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership, also known as the Barcelona Process, that in November 1999 sought to promote a new era of peace, stability and prosperity in the Mediterranean region through closer dialogue and closer cooperation between the European Union and the Southern Mediterranean neighbors. At the time, the conference in Madrid in 1991, uh, that opened the way to the Oslo agreements and to the Middle East peace process, created a climate of optimism about the solution of the long-standing Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and broadly speaking, a climate of optimism on the future of the entire region. However, after 25 years, the Mediterranean is far from being an area of stability and shared prosperity. Not only much still needs to be done to attain this goal, but today the region also is more unstable, as I have well remembered before, fragmented and confrontational than it was in 1995. Not to mention the widening gap in socio-economic standards between the two shores of the Mediterranean. Looking at the broader MENA region, today's the geopolitical changes are the result of two main events that marked two different turning points. First, the war in Iraq in 2003. Second, the 2011 Arab uprisings, the so-called Arab Spring. Both events have shattered the Arab order leaving behind weak or fragile state and civil wars. While so far Arab people's political and socio-economic demands for reform have remained widely unanswered with a few exceptions, the geopolitical context are, is become, uh, has become more unstable. In this transforming context, the U.S. reduced engagement as played as a major exogenous factor with long-term implication on the reconfiguration of the geostrategic context and also of the regional balance of power. Therefore, the post-2011 uh, broader Mediterranean presents a number of geopolitical, security, and socio-economic challenges, unsolved crises, as well as a greater competition among regional players, keen to fill the vacuum left by the diminished U.S. presence, and also keen to increase their influence. New geopolitical alignments, uh, along with uh, old and new rivalries, uh, have more and more characterized the regional system, which is shifting towards a, a sort of confrontational uh, multipolarity. Indeed, in the wake of the Arab uprisings, uh, geopolitical competition uh, has contributed to transform civil conflict uh, conflicts into proxy war, wars, enlarging the involvement of state and non-state actors, and at the same time, making their solution more complex and difficult. Gulf monarchies, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, but also Iran, Israel, and Turkey, with their active Tenses have emerged as the main force of uh, this uh, inferior multipolar order in the MENA region. 
Here, the Saudi-Iranian rivalry, which dates back uh, to 1979, is considered as a, one of the main geopolitical fault lines uh, in the region. Over the recent years, the anti-Iranian front led by Saudi Arabia, which includes uh, also United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Egypt, has been consolidating. Opposition to Tehran is also bringing a geostrategic realignment with Israel under the auspices of the Trump administration that worked to foster a process of normalization of bilateral relations that culminated in the Abraham Accord with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. It, remain, uh, it remains to be, to be seen if, uh, if normalization with Saudi Arabia, between Saudi Arabia and Israel, will be the next step. Jared Kushner, the son-in-law of President Trump, is traveling in this day in, uh, in the Middle East, is visiting first Saudi Arabia and then Qatar. It is, uh, uh, this trip uh, is uh, aimed, uh, first of all, to try to overcome the intra-crisis, uh, uh, the intra-Gulf crisis between Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Bahrain on one side and Qatar on the other, after the blockade against Qatar in June uh, 2017 by Saudi Arabia and its regional allies. But it is seen also uh, as the uh, last attempt of the Trump administration to push the process of uh, normalization between Riyadh and Tel Aviv. After also the, uh, the visit of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to Saudi Arabia the last week. Against this backdrop, the coronavirus pandemic has a hit hard, a region already marred by profound instability, security threat and socio-economic inequalities. It is also accelerating the process of its reconfiguration and the role of the international players in the region. While the incoming US administration is unlikely to open up completely new scenarios from, for the broader Mediterranean, it is likely that the region will be increasing on its own. And this could lead to more intense competition for uh, power and influence. The most obvious axis of competition will be between Iran and its Gulf Arab neighbors. Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and the Emirates. In addition, another competition be, uh, will be between Iran and Israel. The tension between Tehran and Tel Aviv have escalated significantly in uh, recent years and may escalate even further following last day, day's events. I'm referring to uh, the killing of the uh, Iranian nuclear uh, scientists. But in the scramble for the Middle East and North Africa, there is also Turkey, which is uh, very active in the main uh, theaters of crisis. In, in addition, Turkey's activism in the Eastern Mediterranean is posing challenges uh, to other regional countries. However, a different and more collaborative scenario could also be possible. Although the US disengagement from the Middle East won't be reversed by the next administration, a renewed convergence between Washington, where diplomacy first will be the mantra of the incoming President Joe Biden, and Brussels, 
and this uh, uh, convergence uh, may be beneficial for finding a new room of dialogue and cooperation involving also regional countries to overcome current uh, instability. Every country would benefit from reducing tensions, winding down wars, avoiding new ones, and spending less on clients and proxies in times of a global economic downturn. Just remember that according to the latest IMF projections, the MENA region economy will contract on average by five by uh, five. 0.7% in 2020. Indeed, there are some uh, positive, uh, if we can uh, define this way, signals. And uh, um, the Saudi, Arab Saudi Arabia is looking to end the war in, in Yemen. Iran has withdrawn some of its troops uh, from Syria. The United Arab Emirates has normalized the relation uh, with uh, Israel. It won't be easy. It won't be an easy task for the Biden's administration, which inherits a burdensome legacy from his predecessor. Nor for the EU, where common interest must prevail over current disunity among member states of foreign policy. For sure, stability in the broader Mediterranean neighborhood is a key priority for the EU. And it is worth working in this direction and making all efforts to achieve it. Just remember that the EU was on the front line in the negotiation on the Iranian nuclear deal in 2015 and in trying to keep it viable after a US administration retreat in 2018. In conclusion, it is worth mentioning that in the EU Southern neighborhood, the presence of external international powers, as it was remembered in the previous intervention, has greatly increased over the last years. We talk about China's consolidated economic presence. China is uh, one of the top economic partners for many uh, MENA countries. It's uh, uh, first for uh, import and it's uh, the main economic energy partner for, uh, the, uh, for the Gulf countries. In times of global pandemic, China's position appears to have become stronger thanks to its focus on the COVID-19 response as a pillar of strengthening the relations with the Middle Eastern countries. Relations that uh, could uh, um, not only embrace uh, an economic and energy dimension in the future, although, although uh, so far Beijing appears reluctant to engage on the security uh, dimension. But we also talk about Russia, which has become one of the most active and influential external powers and of uh, Moscow strategic clout, especially in, uh, in Syria. So in conclusion, as a Eurasian countries are going towards the, the Middle East. It is from here that the uh, US has to, uh, to start to engage more to diffuse tensions and fostering dialogue among regional players. And in doing so, I think the EU, a united European Union, is the best ally. I stop here and I thank you very much for your attention.